Hello and welcome everybody to ALC Online. We're excited to be back. Yes, we are. Um, and you know, last week was awesome and continuing into this week, we're excited for what God is doing and has in this time. But hey, as we get into it, my name is Lewis. My name's Hannah and it's so good to be here with you this morning. Um, we have just wrapped up our more series, haven't we? I, I believe so, yes, yes. So I'm very excited to see what Pastor Hamish has in store for us today. But why don't you give us some notices, Lewis? Yeah, absolutely. Well, things are cranking up at the moment, getting into things. Um, you know, there's a few exciting things happening. But before I do, you know, there has been a crazy time in New yes, Zealand. I was, just, I was just reminded of it. Yeah. You know, we've had um, earlier this week, there was an earthquake here in Wellington, mm. which was quite big, you know, sh shook the houses. And we've had this crazy um, cyclone go yeah. through the country. Not really hit us down here in Wellington too yeah. bad. Um, but places very close to us, bridges being washed mm -hmm. away, people have lost lives sadly yeah. and it's been pretty crazy so we're going to pray for them later mm -hmm. and um, do what we can to support people struggling in this time as well as those in Turkey with that horrific earthquake as yeah. well and yeah do pray for these people because yes. God loves them and is with them as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it, for us there is a few exciting things happening. One thing, we do have a Slido yes. back, so we've got our Q&A time. I've already seen there's a few questions there already, especially talking about last week's message. Um, but yeah, if you do have any questions about anything at all, um, especially what Hamish talked about last week, you know, it's always an yeah. uh, interesting conversation about prophecy and tongues and different things like that. I encourage you to ask them by going onto Slido.com with the hashtag ALC23, and then Pastor Hamish will answer them on our YouTube channel at 7 p.m., mm -hmm. um, 7, 7 30 p.m. on Sunday evening, New Zealand time, and Wednesday as well. So I encourage you, go and have a look, um, write a question, and join us for that as well. And I do think yes. there is one more thing. Yes, there is. We yeah. have actually brought back our weekly prayer meeting online. It happens every Wednesday evening, 7 p.m., I believe, New Zealand time. Um, but if you would like to be part of that, then we really uh, recommend that you email info at alc.org.nz and we will send you the details or the details for the Zoom um, will be uh, uh, in the description. So we really encourage you to join that. It's a time where we come together online through Zoom and um, just spend some time praying for different needs, different things that are going on um, in our nation and beyond. Uh, so we really encourage that is one way that we love to come together as a community. At the same time, another way is that we want to walk alongside you in your faith journey and in life um, so if you have any prayer needs or prayer requests then please email them to prayer at alc.org.nz and we have someone from our prayer team who will be in touch with you praying with you and speaking through this time with you so um, we really encourage that that's one way that you can be part of our family but um just before we head into the word shall we pray if there's no other notices yeah absolutely and I, yeah. I will encourage you as well if you do need to find anything I want to find them more the best place to go is Linktree, linktr.ee forward slash ALCNZ and everything is on there and one of the tabs is weekly update and like Hannah mentioned there's a lot of stuff on there um, that will help resource you in a lot of different ways so I encourage you go and have a look, read through it and um, yeah we want to help you in any way we can yeah. but also I do want to encourage you um, in this time let's of all that is happening let's put our trust in Jesus let's put our trust in God by giving him to him generously and you know if you're here in New Zealand you can give to ALC here if you like but if you are overseas I encourage you to give to a local um, Christian organization making a difference in your community um, I encourage you to do that, have a look, and if you do need help, message us and we can see what we can do to help you in that area as well. But yeah, let's get into a time yes. of prayer. Let's pray for our country, let's pray mm -hmm. for Turkey, let's pray for everyone watching, and be expectant, because as we seek God, um, we will find Him. As we knock, the door will be opened. And so let's not just sit on things but let's yeah. take them to him today let's Amen. pray together dear we just thank you for this time father we just thank you that you are here with us mm. and you are for us god we thank you that as we come together today we can come together and worship you mm. and we just want to start with thanking you father thanking you through everything that you are so good you're so gracious and who you are brings life to to everyone to mm. so many and father we just pray in this time just we want to just be thankful for all that you are and all that you give us and you know I just pray for as for everyone now is this things God's reminding you of just be thankful for them just say thank you to him 
Father. Yes, because because you always come through mm. and you are always there. Yes. So, Father, we just thank you. We worship you. Yes, and we just choose to trust you today. And also, Father, I just want to lift up everything that's going on in this place. You know, there's the, what's going on in Turkey, what's going on here, what's happening in everyone's lives. God, we just thank you that you are there with us first and foremost. And Father, we just lift up our country to you now. You know, there is challenges up and down the country with earthquakes and with flooding and people's lives being changed and people losing people. Father, we just thank you that you are still here in control. Mm. And we just pray for all those hurting. Father, I just pray you'll comfort them. You'll meet them where they're at and you'll give them your strength to keep going. Mm. For all those that have lost people through this, may you just be there and show them yes, that Lord. there is a way forward. But yes. help them to mourn and help us to mourn with them. Mm. And Father, for those lose, losing houses and don't know what tomorrow's going to look like, I just pray that you will make a way where there isn't one. Yes, You'll show your grace and your comfort. And Father, I just pray you will use us as the church, you use us as the body mm. to go and make a difference in other people's lives. Help us to show your goodness in this time, Father. Yes, Whenever there's a hardship, there's always an opportunity for people to see you. So, Father, we just pray that and believe that mm. in this time. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I just agree with that prayer. And, Lord, I just pray for everyone um, you know, that's watching. And, Lord, people that call ALC home, Lord Jesus. Father, I just pray that you will strengthen us, Lord Jesus. Help us to be there for those that need you, Lord. Father, build us up. Build your kingdom, Lord Jesus, and use us to build your kingdom, Father. Lord, we just pray that... Um, as your sons and daughters, that, Lord, every day we're looking out for chances and opportunities yes. to spread your word, Lord, to, to bring people into your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Give us the boldness to step out, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that, Lord, as people are joining us this morning, that, Lord, you will place other people in their minds to go out and talk to you after the service, Lord Jesus. Father, help us to be a community for those that need a community, Lord Jesus. Father, I just pray that... Um, for those who are, you know, just wanting to come back to you, who are, who are yearning for that love from you, Lord, that, Father, you will meet them where they're at, Lord Jesus. Father, Lord, show them who you are, Lord Jesus. Lord, just give them this heavenly peace that they've never felt before, Father. Lord, we just ask that you come and you do what only you can do this morning, Jesus. Yes, God. Yeah, Father, we just, yeah, we just thank you, and yeah, we just pray for, for all those in Turkey, God. You mm. know, it's v very hard and sad to see, Father. And we just thank you that there are Christians, your your people there that are stepping in and making a difference. May you just yes. surround them and be with them and go before them. And Father, we just thank you for all that you are yes, doing so in this time. And I just pray for those who have lost hope. May yes, you be Lord. their hope. May mm. you be their strength. And Father, we just pray. Yeah, as, as a church that you will continue to lead us and use us to yes, live more Lord. than just ourselves but for your purpose and mission's sake yes. to help others to love the broken and the lost yes, and father as we just continue and go into this new series father we, we pray and expectantly that you you have so much more for us mm. not just to receive but to give to follow and to lead and more of you father and so we thank you for this time may you just speak to Every single person, strengthen them and use them, we pray. And Father, we just thank you for all that you are and all that you're doing. May your kingdom come. May you help every single person, draw them closer to you. If everyone watching today, Father, I just thank you that there is so much more for them. Surround them with people. Surround yes, them with community. And Father, we thank you for all that you are and all that you're doing. In yes, Jesus' Lord. name we pray. Amen. amen amen do know that we are praying for you and if you've got any prayer requests feel free to email them to prayer at alc.org.nz and we would love to pray with you and for you whatever that may be but hey we're getting into a new series yes, we are. called it's your time to shine yes. hopefully got that right yes. but it's looking at first peter and going through it over a few few weeks few months um but really going in depth of of what Peter is writing to the churches at the time. And you know, as as we are, they are going through a, a difficult time, mm. the early church, re, you know, it was a hard time to be a follower of Jesus. And so, you know, we're gonna go through that yeah. and be encouraged that it is your time to shine. So we're gonna hand it over to Pastor yes. Hamish and get into the word today. Thank you, Pastor Hamish.
Thank you, team. Hey, that was a um, fantastic song. We need to sing that. I remember Lindell Cooley, I used to have that on, on repeat way back in the 90s, the late 90s, Lindell Cooley. It was a song of revival. We were seeing God move powerfully, and, and that was a song that I couldn't get enough of. It's a, it's a great song. Welcome, church. It's so good to have you with us. If you're joining us online, welcome. Good to have you with us as we come together to worship, to open up scriptures, and to press into the things of God. I don't know about you, but I know this has been a tumultuous week for us in terms of climate and everything else that's happened. Like so much, it began with something that I can deal with this. This is we've been here. Done, done this before and then it just sort of built and built and built and um, and I think it took a lot of people by surprise and I think it took a lot of us by surprise in terms of its effect and as a consequence as a nation we're dealing with that. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us as people of faith to think about how do we how do we respond when life does not track the way we, we anticipated. How do we respond to situations around us in ways that bring hope, that bring life? How do we respond uh, in ways that point beyond what is to what will be? Because, you know, I think so often in, in situations that we've been through, and maybe you've been through something similar in your life, wherever you're watching us from, is that when, when the rains come, when storms come, when cyclones come, when flooding comes, we start to get anxious. And so many people are starting to say, oh, this is the, the judgment of God, and this is God saying, and this is God doing, and, and everything else. And I just think, man, you know, when Christians say, do you not read your Bible? Like, I read my Bible a little bit more than perhaps um, some of you do, because I get paid to. Um, <laughs> but what I do do is, Three times a year, four times a year, I, I get to go through it. And in Genesis, in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, there's God's promise with a rainbow, I will not flood the nations like that again. In other words, as much as you might rock and, and just want me to just slam the door and turn away, I will not end rains and devastate the world that way again. And that means that, that no matter what's happening around us, we have a hope and we should be living out of that in ways that point beyond what is to what can be, that, that what's happening around us, uh, we, we don't just pin on God, but we say, in the midst of the storms, how do we live out of your promise to bring your grace to bear? very real sense. That's why we're starting a new series today. And if you're joining us online, um, it's so good that, that you're tracking with us because we are starting a new it's your time to shine where we begin to open up the message of 1 Peter because I think that one of the struggles that we face in the church as Christians as people of faith is how do we live as outsiders in, a, in, in the world today I think the reality is that that if we were to take a step back over the last four years especially but even longer than that there's been massive cultural shifts so of the west at any rate had been found on Christian values and there were certain things whether we were Christian or otherwise that we took for granted. There were moral boundaries, there were ethical boundaries um, that were just established, and we never within those, even if we weren't faith, these boundaries existed. But now everything's changed. In the midst of all of that change and upheaval, it's almost like not only have the boundaries re been redrawn, they've been redrawn in ways that push people of faith to the margins, and, and they begin to redraw the boundaries in ways that marginalize people of faith. And in the, the, the marginalization process, we're faced with, with a choice. How do we respond? How do we live? Because so much of the response that I've observed and through other people, and maybe you have too, the response has been pushed back. The response has been, become very um, argumentative, to be very, uh, to, to be very forceful and, and, and just condemning and, and criticizing those who, who do not share their views. And, and the very thing that they... They level the accusations against um, people who disagree with them uh, and saying, you don't listen to my views. Well, they don't listen to their views either, and on it goes. And, and that's why we're doing a new, this new series. It's, it's your time to shine, because I believe in this, the cultural shifts that have taken place and the world in which we find ourselves. We need to learn to live as outsiders so that we 
and shine because we believe we've been called to be a community of hope for our city and beyond. That makes you a hope carrier. And we've got to learn to live in ways that carry that hope. We've got to learn to live in ways that reflect the hope that we have so that we point beyond what is to what can be so that we we're not limited by by the boundaries that have been around us we're not living action to to ideologies and 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 political decisions and all those things that great with us that push our button and we push back against but we live in response to what's happening around us and let our light shine for all to see I think now, no matter, uh, more than, than any other time, the world needs to see hope. The world needs hope. You know, in the midst of everything that's happening politically, ideologically, philosophically, financially, the world needs to know that, that God has not abandoned us, that there is a hope in heaven waiting for us, that, that God has not turned his back on us. But it requires of us to be able to, to live in ways can see Jesus in us so they can see that and begin to track from where they are out of those places of bondage and, and everything else into the fullness of what God has for us. Because as I keep saying, people have to see Jesus before they will follow in our day lives. And that's why we're doing this series on, on 1 Peter, because I think that 1 Peter helps us understand how to live as outsiders in a, in a broken world. It helps us understand how to let our light shine because 1 Peter is one of the earliest manuscripts that we have that deals with this whole tension of how do Christians live in relation to the spirit. How do Christians, how ought to Christians in response to what is happening around them in ways that point beyond what is to be? How do Christians live in ways that reflect the hope of the kingdom because Without that, we're just like everybody else. And, and so we're doing this series, uh, we're unpacking the message of 1 Peter so that we can shine in the midst of everything that is happening around us. So uh, by way of introduction, let's jump into just the first two verses. I'm going to look at verse 1 and 2 because I think they, are, they, they help set the scene so much. So it begins by opening up, this is, is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, um, begs the question, Know who is Peter? Many of you know something about Peter. Um, you know, Peter is the, the is the one one of the first of the disciples that Jesus called early on. His, his brother um, was responsible for that, and of course we know him as Peter. But he grew up as as a guy called um, Simon. Uh, some people called him Simon Peter, and, and Jesus changed his name to Peter. And I think it's really important for us to to recognize his name Simon. We don't want to build too much on it, but his name Simon meant reed. He was an impulsive person. He was impetuous. He was strong-minded. Once he made his mind up, that was it. But, but there was a sense in which he, he, he was easily shaped and blew like reeds blow. And then as he began to listen to Jesus and, and observe, there came a point where Jesus turned to his disciples and said, you know, I know what people are saying about me. What do you say? And, he's, and he, G, uh, Peter declared the sovereignty of Jesus and, and, and the, the lordship of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus. And G Jesus said to him, you know, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. You didn't get this by listening to other people, but you got it because of the spirit of God. And he changed his name from Simon to Peter, Peter Rock. He went from a flake to something solid that you could count on. And on your faith, uh, I'm going to build my church. And, and he said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And again, that's why... Many of, of us grew up, whether we're Christians or not, thinking of, you know, our, whatever your picture of is heaven, at some point you've had this picture where there's a cloud or there's gates, there's whatever, and there's a wall and there's these big pearly gates, and there's Peter, the gatekeeper. Well, this is where it comes from, because in the scripture, Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so that people sort of had this notion that he's the gatekeeper. He's going to let you in or keep you out. And of course, you know how to get into heaven if, you're, if, if you've been here for a while. Um, <clears throat> it's really simple. I think we overcomplicate it. There was a, a guy who, he and his wife were having an argument in the car one day, driving home from, from a, a, a night out, and they, she was upset at his behavior, and he was upset about her, um, her constant criticisms, and in the, in the midst of the argument, they crashed. And, um, and um, he woke up and he's there before the pearly and Peter's there and he looks around and he says I never thought I'd be here and he says everybody 
comes up here. And he says, am I in heaven? He said, no, no, no. He said, I've got these keys that I'm not... He said, um, he said, well, what do I have to get in? He says, it's really easy. He said, you just have to spell the most powerful word in the world. And this guy thinks about it for a moment and he goes, hmm. And he says, L-O-V-E. And Peter says, well done, my son. Welcome to eternal rest. Wow, this is so good. That, that's easy. And anyway, he's just going to the gates and a little phone by the, by the um, gates ring. And, it's, and um, Peter picks up the phone. Says, I'll be there in a minute. He puts it down and says, I've got something important to attend to. Can you just stand here? No one Jew, um, so, you know, it's okay. Just, but just look after the gates. And he thinks, that's fine. So he's, he's looking at the gates and suddenly, poof, and there is his wife on the other side. Now, his wife had been diligent in her prayer and her attendance at church and everything else. And she looks at him on the other side and says, how did you get here? And he said, it's really easy. He said, you just have to spell um, one word and you're in. And she says, well, what's the word? And he says, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. But that, that's where he is. But Peter, Peter was one of the first disciples to see Jesus after, after his death, uh, after his resurrection. And also... I think one of the things that's significant Peter is recorded as very early martyrs of the 12 disciples. Uh, he was crucified in 64 AD. Uh, the tradition has it that he was, he was crucified upside down uh, at the uh, um, behest of Nero, who was the Roman governor. Uh, and I say that it just gives us a little understanding of who Peter is, and he writes now, People would, would criticize and say Peter couldn't have written his gospel because the writing, the style and everything else, if you, if you read, doesn't fit a fisherman with no education. But if you flick to the end of 1 Peter chapter 5, he talks about how Silas is writing it for him. In other words, I'm dictating Silas is writing because Silas is more polished. He can take my thoughts and, and my words that are a bit rough and sound like a fisherman um, and he can make them palatable to everybody else down through history to read so so that's a little bit about Peter so he carries on this is this letter is from Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontius uh, Galatia Cappadocia Asia Thinia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago the Spirit has made you holy as a result you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ may God give you more and more grace and peace <clears throat> more and more grace and peace now the context here uh, um, I, I alluded to was because Peter was crucified he was put he died as a martyr in 64 AD and the and this context writing to a church that's been that's being persecuted. Remember, initially the persecution against the church arose internally from, from the Jews who took offense that, that here are people who are responding to Jesus the Messiah that they would not recognize and, and God is, is pouring out his favor upon them. And so uh, it starts off as religious persecution and then they set it up, it becomes political because uh, Rome doesn't want, that, that wants a, wants a a happy state. It wants peace. And so, therefore, from their point of view, if we, to keep the Jews happy, we just get rid of knock off new religious cult and, and everything. The persecution's been building, and then Nero comes to rule in, in uh, Rome. If you know Roman history, he's the greatest of rulers, and to deflect from some pretty bad decisions, he begins to persecute the, he begins to persecute the, the um, the church, the Christians, uh, and deflect everything that's happening in Rome and, and through the empire. That's, that's just the wheels are coming off. It's, everything's turning to custard. So he blames these people and he begins to persecute them. And I say that because it helps us understand, understand something really important. Um, or first of all, if you go to the next one, here's the map. So, so that you, get the, you can get the geography. So, so where everything started down, down here and now they are being pushed out to Cappadocia, Glacier Pond. Bithynia, uh, Asia, and all that, you've got Rome over, over here. So you can see that they have been pushed out of, out of their homeland, out of where they're from, and everything else. Primarily, it's a Gentile church. He's writing to Gentiles who have been, um, who have been forcibly removed. And it, does, and it helps us understand something really important in terms of this whole book that we are going to come back to again and again and again. We work through it. If you treat your Bible life textbook, if you go to verse 1, you underline the phrase, 
foreigners, or some of your versions might have something like as strangers, as aliens. Now, I, I encourage you to underline it, circle it, do whatever you, what, do whatever you do, mark it up, but, but here's what I want you to understand. Often we interpret this um, metaphorically. We, we are just foreigners. Because we've been born again, our citizenship's in heaven. We don't belong here. We're passing through. Um, and certainly there is that sense about it. No question of that. But the danger of, uh, of looking at it metaphorically is, oh, oh, we're just foreigners. We just go through. So we turn, our eyes, we, uh, we turn our eyes away from what's happening. We just shut our eyes, God. You know, I'm just passing through. I'm not going to let this affect me. And, and we just live as though we, of what's happening in the world has no influence on us because our citizenship is in heaven. We're passing through. We just suck it up. We grow and bear it. And so ignore what's happening on the basis that our reward awaits us in heaven. And I get that. And maybe that's how you've looked at it. Maybe that's how you've read it and it's shaped your theology and how you live. But that's not what Peter means. This phrase here, living foreigners, is actually a Roman term used very specifically to describe a particular group of people. They are people who are low citizens but are slaves. It's a very real class of people. They don't have the rights, the freedoms, um, or anything like that of citizens, but they have more than slaves. So people who are living as foreign, a group of people, for example, you're told where you can live, what jobs you can do, who you can marry, who you can't marry. Um, you, you're not allowed to own property. Uh, there's certain things that you can and can't do. When it comes to justice, you, you will not receive the same level of justice in courts because but you and strata of society that cannot access that. So basically, if you're a Roman citizen and I'm a foreigner and we both commit the same crime, my punishment's going to be disproportionate compared to yours because you're a citizen, so you deserve leniency. I'm not, so I don't. Um, there are, I, I don't have access to that justice. And so you can imagine that these Christians that have people writing to, you can imagine in this context how they must feel, what their, what their worldview's like. And for a moment, you've been forced out of home to live somewhere you didn't live. You can't practice your profession the way that you did. Um, there's barriers on so much of your social freedoms. You're not allowed to have money. You're not allowed to do a whole lot of things. How is that going to shape your attitude towards authority? How's it going to shape your attitude towards uh, those who make decisions, to the influencers, to the ruling class, um, to those who have freedoms, and, and on it goes? Imagine for a moment what their lives would be like and how they would see the world as, as a consequence of that. And, and I say that because if you imagine you were there and you've had your free rights removed from you and you can no longer do what you used to do, you the freedom to, to live your life the way that you did. Things that you'd worked hard for have been taken off you and you've been pushed out, excluded from full participation in society. I can imagine how angry, how frustrated and how negative you might be towards powers and authorities. And yet I say that because with that in mind, I love the way that Peter opens up his letter. He opens it up by interpreting suffering and, and, and persecution and being marginalized for faith in Jesus Christ in essentially hope-filled terms and hopeful terms. In verses 1 and 2, he says, in the midst of your suffering and persecution, in the midst of being forced from your home, denied your rights, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and His Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed Him and you have been cleansed, you've been forgiven, and you, he's going to give you grace upon grace. These are hopeful terms, chosen, being made holy, full of grace. And in your own time, you can read the rest of um, chapter 1, and you'll, oddly enough, after verse 2, verse 3, and he talks about a living hope. He declares that we've been given as a consequence of this a living hope. You see, he opens up by reminding them in real hopeful terms of who they are, of their identity. You, he said, you're not defined by your circumstance. You're not being defined by governments and everything else. He said, I want to remind you of who you are. He said, your identity is not being determined by others. It's not being given to you by authorities and everything else. Your, your identity is being given to you by God. 
who chose you and has made you holy. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says this, before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ. Before he made the world, before governments reformed, before COVID, before um, uh, cyclones, before anything, he chose you and loved you. And he decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And get this, he wanted to do it, and it gives him great pleasure. You may look at yourself in the mirror sometimes, and you may look at your life, and you may look at your attitude, you may look at your behavior, you might look at some of the the struggles that you have with, with issues of sin that separate you from God or separate you from others, and you may think, God, how could you love me? could you and it becomes a a source of discouragement in your mind then you need to remind yourself of how God sees you he wanted to adopt you wanted you to be part of this family and it gives him great pleasure it doesn't mean to say that he loves everything you and I do at times it doesn't mean to say that he was often thinking wow that was so good I love the way you flip that person off at the lights Man, I love the way you just rode the horn as you sat on the bumper of that car in front because you didn't think they were driving fast enough. No, he says, you give him great pleasure. You see, the issue that Peter writes to address um, to to the churches that have been scattered, and the reason we're spending time doing this deep dive um, through the the book of, of 1 Peter, is it's not about how to endure hardship or suffering or persecution or anything like that, but how in the midst of that, Next one. We should live in ways that reflect our faith, our confidence and hope in Jesus Christ. He's writing to a church whose whose natural tendency is the same as yours and mine in times of opposition, of persecution, of suffering, of being marginalized for no other reason than because of your values of your faith. We push back. We get angry and we begin to become activists. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be, be active, but he's saying, you know, don't let this be your response. He's writing to encourage them to live in ways that reflect faith, confidence, and hope in in Jesus Christ. That's why he writes in this letter about submitting to authorities. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew, for example, don't be afraid of those who kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God destroyed by um, soul and body and health. He says, why do you spend so much time? He's reminding them, why do you invest emotional time getting angry about decisions by, 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 by leaders who can at, at best just kill your body? They can't, don't let them take your soul. Don't let them rob you of your faith. Take your focus off them and put it back on God. Learn to fear him justly so that your body and soul will will spend eternity where it's it's designed to be. That's why he writes about submitting to authority. That's why he writes in 1 Peter 2.19, for God is pleased when we are conscious of his will, um, we patiently endure untreatment. In other words, he's saying, you know, I want you to understand that when when you recognize who you are and you're living a life that's seeking to reflect faith, hope, and confidence in Christ, then you recognize that this is more important than what you're going through. And so therefore, um, you're willing to suffer because it's an opportunity to be a witness to Jesus. It's not that God causes suffering. It's not that God wants you to suffer. If there's a choice between suffering and not suffering, I tell you what, I know which one I'm choosing every day. You don't even have to come and ask me. If there's a choice, don't even come and say, Hamish, which which road are you choosing? I've already chosen it. I'm taking the the non-suffering one. However... If God says, I want you to take the suffering road, I'm going to take it. Again, don't come and ask me which one are you going to take. It's already determined. I'm going to do what God says. If I have a choice, I know which one I'm going to choose. Because God doesn't want us to suffer needlessly. But he says that if for my sake you are going to, he said, I'm pleased when you do it well. And that's why he goes on and says things like in 1 Peter, in in chapter 3, verse 8, he says, we should have one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters. You see, because when we do all of this, what's happening is that we we are now living out of our hope. We're now living out of God's kingdom. We're living out of faith in response to what's happening rather than reacting against what's happening. And when that happens, then we are able to become who God wants us to be and people see Jesus so they can follow him. 
instead of just hearing angry people who are pushing back or, or doing whatever against other people. So remember, I talked, I think last week, I said to change a behavior, you've got to change a belief. And what Peter's seeking to do is to change beliefs, to get them to recognize that what they're going through is not a reflection of God's will for their life. What they're going through is just living in a fallen world and they, they need to re realign their faith and their hope in the one who has called them and redeemed them so that they can live in ways that bear witness to Jesus. Because as you will see when we go through 1 Peter, is that Peter's emphasis on your greatest witness is not the words that you speak, but the life that you live. Your greatest witness is not the words that you speak, but the life that you live. So to a church that is essentially younger than ALC has been around, but a church that's struggling with, with, with persecution, with struggling how to respond to what's happening around it, he writes this really encouraging letter to not only remind them of who they are, but he does it in ways that, that help elevate their thinking and, and reorient them around what matters because he uses words and terms that, that remind them of, of not just their identity in God, but, but something greater. He reminds them of of, of what they've been grafted into and, and God's faithfulness with his people that he's chosen and, and through set how God was working with them and tracked with them through good times, through hard, through persecution in the Old Testament. He uses the, the relationship with Israel. Now, because just by way of, uh, because this is the introduction, you know, so if you read some books or commentaries on 1 Peter, uh, a lot of people, the common thing is to say that because of the way he introduces his, his letter by talking about we're chosen, we're holy, and all that sort of stuff, they talk about how this is a sign that the church has now replaced um, uh, Judaism and, and everything else and replaced Israel. I want to say no it's not. I want to say the reason he uses these, the, the analogy and uses the language of the Old Testament is to remind them of what we've been grafted into and we can look back now at a, at, a, at, at a couple of thousand years of history and see God's faithfulness and that will encourage and strengthen us. So for example in Deuteronomy we read God says to them after he's, he's taken them out of, out of slavery and he's, and he's redeemed them and he set them apart and he's been faithful to them. And he says, you're going to be my people, a holy people who belong to me. And of all the people on earth, I've chosen you to be my special treasure. This is the history of, of God's relationship with Israel. And so what does Peter do? He says, in his letter, he talks about, next one. He talks about how God's chosen us and made us holy. See the similarity? To remind and through them to remind you and I, if God was faithful to his covenant and to his people then, he will be faithful to you and I now. They went through waters, but they weren't overwhelmed. They went through fires, but they weren't burnt and consumed. And neither will you or I, if we stay focused on him and live out of our relationship with him and live out of our faith rather than our circumstances. He helps them see that the goal is to live lives characterized by faithfulness, holiness, and love. Because when we live lives that are characterized by this, people are seeing Jesus rather than anything else. And I say that because we're called to be people of hope. And for us to be a people of hope, for us to be a community of hope, then we need to stop reacting to what's happening around us and start responding out of our identity and start responding out of, our, out of the kingdom. And 1 Peter helps us understand what that looks like and, and how to do it in our context so that people begin to see what it means to live a life of faith that is not shaped by circumstance, that is not being unsettled by what's happening around us, but is characterized by faithfulness, holiness, and love because we are focused on the one who is before all things and in whom all things are held together. Does that make sense? Uh, and that's why I really love this book. Um, these first opening verses... Um, these opening verses are really helpful in, in getting us, giving us a picture of, of, what is, of what's to come, I guess. Which, of course, begs the question, what, what do we do with this? Um, and, and let me just illustrate it by, by way of this. Imagine, for example, um, I had a piece of 4 by 2 um, as, as most of us commonly know it, laid out across here in front of the stage. Um, and I asked you to walk across it. I'm willing to bet that all of you would walk across it. No question asked. I'm willing to bet that if I had a piece of wood laid out here and said, okay, who's willing to walk across it? You'd all walk across it. 
But if I raised it six feet and then said, okay, who's willing to walk across it? I'm willing to bet that some of you would say, pass. And some of you would say, yeah, I'll give it a go. And then if I was to raise it, say, four meters and said, okay, so okay, who's willing to give it a go? I'm willing to bet there'd be fewer of you. And then if I was to raise it another couple of meters, I'm willing to bet that there's probably nobody who says, yeah, I'm going to do that. What's changed? The wood's the same. The thickness of it's the same. It's when it's on the ground, it's on a firm foundation, isn't it? And I think that the reason so many of us react to life rather than respond is because we've, we've lost touch with our foundations. Jesus says this in, in Matthew. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains come and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. In other words, he's saying, you know, if you don't want to be buffeted by circumstance and be undermined by what's happening around you, then you need to not just hear what I say, you need to build your life on it. You need to build on me and my, on my word, on the things of my kingdom. And he said, when you do that, when you build your life on these things, you won't collapse. You see, I think that the reason so many of us, <coughs> pardon me, push back against what's happening is, is because we're, we're worried about collapsing. But the promise of Jesus is when we build on him, we won't collapse. And, and I think that's important to, for us to let, settle in our soul that, that it's what our reaction is a reflection of where we are and our faith at the moment. I think sadly so many of us have become intimidated by what's happening around us that we, we're looking at our circumstances rather than remembering the foundation upon which we stand. And as a consequence, we're worried about this. Whereas if we're building on Christ, we don't need to worry. You know... I think another thing that we need to recognize when we go through, um, think about what Peter's saying and why, is that one of his calls to the church is to remind them that you, you can't just try and fit in with everybody, keep your head down and just let it all pass over. And you know, when there's a new emperor, then we'll go back, get back to normal. He said, there's no room for that. And I say that because I think so many of us life thinking well I'll just I own my faith I'm devout in my faith but I'm just going to fit in I'm just going to go through I'll keep my head down I won't rock the boat and, and I understand that I you know none of us wants to be persecuted none of us want to face opposition for our faith and, and yet last week I mentioned in Revelation 19 verse 10 that how the spirit of um, prophecy is, is, a, is a witness to Jesus well in Revelation chapter 12 we read this that they defeated him that's a spiritual by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony and they did not love their lives so much as they were afraid to die now that's you know i talked about the testimony of jesus testimony here in greek it's the word that we get matter from in other words they were willing to die for their faith because they weren't afraid of the ones that could kill the body and that's all they loved and honored the one who who, who also held the soul in, in the palm of his hand and I say that because really there's a sense in which we need to recognize that, and, and this is one of the things we'll see as we go through 1 Peter, that if we are true to our faith, then we should expect opposition. In fact, down through the history of the church, writer after writer, church leader after church leader has posed the question, and generation after generation, if you are not experiencing pushback because of your faith, then are you really living your faith? Because the only reason you won't be experiencing it is people don't really know. Or that you're not pushing a back against the values. You're not reflecting Jesus and his kingdom. The, the, the church has always had this view until, until recently, um, certainly until, until the Middle Ages, was that because you are a Christian, expect to push back. Because you're a Christian, expect people to reject you. Expect people to marginalize you. Because you name the name of Christ. 
Now, I'm not saying that you're going to lose your job or anything like that, but if you're, at, if you're at high school, if you're at university, and people don't mock you, then the question is, what are you living? Because I know university students, I know high school students, I know what our culture's like at the moment. If people in your workplace are not slightly antagonistic towards you because you're a Christian, not because you do other things, but because you're a Christian, then maybe you're not living your faith to the fullness that God wants us to live in. I'm not looking for it, but the whole thing here is that our testimony should bring us into conflict. And it will only do that if we're not afraid of other people. Otherwise, we dial it down. You see, the message of, of Peter is simply that, you know, grumbling and pushing back against people, against decisions, uh, political decisions, or against cultural decisions, or the redefining of moral boundaries and everything else, is not the witness that we're called to live out of. It's not what we've been called to do. What we've been called to do is to live in ways that reflect God's kingdom and, and help people contrast the kingdom of God with the kingdom of this world. And, and even when we feel marginalized and, and pushed back, we need to not be afraid of them, not keep our head down, but be true to our witness. That's what we're going to see uh, as we open up the book of 1 Peter. And the reason that he's careful, he's, he's um, passionate about this is that the, we have to reflect Jesus no matter what, because without that, as we see Jesus himself said in, in the Gospel of John, next one, he says, you know, how are people going to know that he's the, the way, the truth, and the life? No one can come to the Father except through me, says Jesus. How are they going to know unless we live it? How are they going to know unless we let them see who Jesus is and that this is what it means? And this is why it's a big deal. Because once they know Jesus, Jesus said that they can be set free. Next verse. It says that as they come to him, the truth, they'll be set free. You know, the reality is that for us to set people free from the bondage of sin is going to cost us. It's going to cost us in, in a myriad of ways. And if we're not willing to pay that cost, then nothing's going to change. The light's not going to shine. Prisoners are going to be um, kept in bondage. And God's kingdom is not going to come. Now, it doesn't mean to say that we ignore what's happening around us. We gr just grin and bear it when, when decisions are made which are contrary to the kingdom. It doesn't mean to say that we suffer for suffering's sake. But what it does mean is that rather than process suffering and marginalization and all that in, in ways that are uh, emotional, ways that uh, the, the rest of the world does, we do it in ways that reflect God, that reflect Jesus, that reflect his kingdom um, more clearly than we would otherwise. And that's why as we go through, one of the other great themes that you'll see in the book of um, Peter is the, uh, the importance of community, the importance of, of biblical community and, and what that should look like. Um, for example, in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, respect and love the family of believers. You know, most of us in settle for just like one another well just just like those around you who are different like those who don't like the way you do at least like those who don't share your views about this or you just like them but Peter says no you've got to love them you've got to you've got to love them and um, chapter 5 verse 9 you know he says stand firm um, st stand firm against this is our enemy be strong in our faith and remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. He's saying that, you know, once we get everything in our head and we begin to live it, we begin to recognize what's happening to us is common around the world. And it's a reflection of the fact we belong to the same family. And again, that's why we make a big thing being in connect groups because when you feel marginalized, when you feel, um, you know, excluded, when you feel something that maybe others don't, they can help you process it and understand how to turn it into a prayer so that the light of Christ can shine through you into the darkness, so that you can be a witness to him. So that instead of being a clanging gong, just pushing back against everything and, and claiming this theory and that theory and everything else. And I'm not saying they're wrong, those people, but I'm saying they don't change them anything. What change will change things is the way that you live Jesus. And you need family to help you do that. 
They can pray for you. They can encourage you. So with that in mind, just let me give you one final, leave you with this final thought. Does the way you live help ease the anxieties and frustrations of others, or does it add to them? Does the way you live ease anxieties and frustrations of those around you? Or do you are just adding to that? You know, I know Christians, sadly, who are so wedded to these particular views about the way the world's working and everything. And I'm not saying they're wrong, but I'm saying the way they go about it is just adding. It's not, it's not easing anything. It's not engaging people. It's pushing them further away. It's not reflecting Jesus. When Jesus encountered a woman caught in adultery, he didn't, well, you're getting what you deserve. How dare you? You know, without compromising the truth and integrity, he engaged, he eased the burden to make a way. And that's what we're going to see in 1 Peter as we go through it. So with that in mind, I, I encourage you to read the book through. We are going to have uh, a, lot, a lot of, there'll be a lot of questions and it'll be, I, I hope that it will be transformative for us in our faith and our hope and our love as we, as we journey together. So with that in mind, I'm going to pray. Father, thank you for your grace that's called us uh, in these days to be a witness to you and your kingdom captivate our hearts with what can be, that we would begin to let go of those things that we need to let go of in order to take a more firm hold on on the things that are going to help us reflect you. Lord, your character, your ways, which are not our ways, they don't come naturally to us. To be a witness to the truth in ways that perhaps, Lord God, we would not thought of before, in order to make a way for people to, to come to you, to be set free from the bondage of sin, to be able to experience your love and your mercy for themselves. So Lord, change us as we go through this for the good of others and for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. What an awesome message that was from Pastor Hamish. We really encourage that if something stood out to you, then um, make sure to email him, giving him your feedback, um, but also just meditate upon this word as you go throughout the rest of your week. And just a reminder that if you do have any questions from today's sermon, you can ask them at slider.com using the hashtag ALC23 as the password. Um, You know, this is a time where we get to come together and just figure out all of this together. Chances are that the questions you have, someone else may also have. Um, And it's just a way to, you know, come together and um, reflect on the word that we've heard today. So we're really looking forward to what next week is going to hold in this new series. So do join us back. Uh, next week again. Lewis, would you like to wrap us up in prayer? Absolutely. I'm excited for what this series holds and um, I'm excited for all that God is doing in this time. So let's be expectant, but let's pray and let us pray over you as you go Mm. into all that is ahead. Father, I thank you for all that you are and all that you're doing. God, I thank you that you have more for us in this time and I Mm. thank you that it is our time to shine. It is our time to get expectant and excited for all that you have. And Father, we just pray for every single person. May you go before them and strengthen them, them, use them in this time. Father, thank you that mm. they are more than just their jobs. They're more than just we, what they do in mm. the day. They are your children first. And fa- Father, we just pray your blessing upon yes, them, Lord. strengthen yes, them, Lord. give them peace and your joy, and lead them into all that you have. Yes, Father, Lord. we thank you for all that you are and all that you're doing. May your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We'll have an incredible week. Yes. Hopefully we get some sunshine here, but hey, we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great week, and we'll see you later.